This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZICS ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. Hello. Um, so welcome to the, uh, uh, the Global Rising Stars session. So this is the third year that we have had this session now. Um, and I'd very much like to thank both Baxter and Pfizer for their financial support, which is absolutely crucial to making this happen. And uh, it's fantastic that they're uh, willing to support a sort of more novel concept. Um, I'd also like to very much thank the ANZIPS board, who's been very supportive of this over the three years. So initially, Mary White as president was very supportive, and then Andrew has continued that in the entire board. And also thank you to the conveners, so who have been very supportive. So in 2013, David Rigg um, was very supportive and uh, put it in part of the program, and David's here today. And then Steve Warrillo, and finally Alex this year, they've all been very supportive and, and included in the program. Um, and so the concept behind this was after a, a failed attempt when I was a scientific convener in 2012 to try and set this up uh, because I couldn't find a financial supporter. Um, but the idea was to have uh, early career researchers, uh, both uh, as an early career researcher myself, it's often difficult to get a platform internationally to present at. But also I feel that as an early career researcher you have uh, a little bit more flexibility than you do as a mid or senior career researcher, you don't have that, the, the binds of infrastructure and having to find funding all the time. So it does allow you to be a little bit more flexible and novel in your approach and, uh, and to be a little bit more exciting. So I thought that there was an advantage for the program for that. And it's also meant to establish a long-standing collaboration between each of the investigators and ANSICS itself. So we've got two speakers today. Uh, very, very high quality speakers. So the first is Eust Wersinger from Amsterdam. So Eust did his um, PhD at Amsterdam under Tom van der Poel. Uh, is very interesting because he's, uh, one of his areas of research interest is in meliodosis, which I asked him how prevalent meliodosis was in Holland. And I don't think uh, there has been an endemic uh, a, a case from, from Amsterdam that hasn't involved a return traveller before, but it does show that uh, it does highlight the global um, nature of his research, uh, and he put in a, a fantastically interesting abstract related to sort of um, a basic science in an animal model, and I think he'll provide some fascinating data, and uh, it'll be a great talk. So thanks very much, Houston. Thanks very much for flying out. Yeah, and, uh, thanks a lot uh, for this nice introduction. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I also would like to uh, thank the organizers for allowing me to present my data here. It's really nice. Um, so what I'm, uh, I'm doing in, in Amsterdam, we're studying host pathogen interactions uh, in sepsis, and we do know that the mortality of sepsis is steadily seems to go down over the last years. But we hope that by better understanding the host pathogen interactions, what's really going on, we can identify potential novel uh, treatment targets which you can use for additional immune therapies, and we have various mouse models for that. So we are studying uh, sepsis, and I would like to share some uh, novel data on the potential role of the gut microbiota in the pathogenesis of pneumonia-derived sepsis. Um, and talking about this host pension interactions, there, uh, you, it, it's a quite a, a, a quick turn to go to the microbiota because there has been this overwhelming um, uh, research on the gut microbiota in recent years. Uh, in all the big journals, um, you see uh, papers popping up, but now if you look at PubMed, every day 100 new articles on the gut microbiota are published in peer-reviewed journals. So it's really a, a big field now. I love this, um, this, uh, this covers of on our fellow travelers, your inner ecosystem. So there are so many bacteria out there that you can wonder, do they also play a role in sepsis? And also in the popular literature, more and more time is being devoted on the gut microbiota. So perhaps some of you have read this, uh, this uh, very interesting book. It's called Poop Power. Uh, poop power, a do-it-yourself guide to cure yourself. And this book is actually now on the, or it was on the number one spot of the Amazon help yourself uh, list. And this is a person who had suffering from ulcerative colitis and he was giving himself a fecal microbiota transfer, so a stool uh, transplantation, and he was cured. So the logical question is, would this also work for sepsis? And then perhaps it does. I've, perhaps you have seen this paper, very recent work, 
uh, derived from China, and these are the first patients with therapy refractory sepsis who have been treated with FMT, fecal microbiota transplantation, and according to these case reports, they were cured. Uh, two papers, one in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, one in Critical Care Medicine, and those were patients on the, for a long time on the ICU. They kept fever, positive blood cultures with uh, gram negatives, and persistent diarrhea, and they gave uh, fecal transplantation, and then they were cured. A lot of issues on, on these uh, cases, though. But anyway, food for thought, I think. Um, so what I would like to, uh, to discuss today with you are just three points. One, uh, some overall background on the gut microbiota basics. Then I would like to share some experimental preclinical data from mouse models in which we studied the role of the gut microbiota in pneumonia-derived sepsis. And then perhaps we can use that information to identify potential new strategies that target the gut microbiota in our critical ill um, patient population. But let me start with just the background. Um, so there, there was this study on the ICU that um, more than 50% of the patients on the ICU on a daily basis do receive worldwide antibiotics. Uh, and that will be different in, in uh, well, all places around the world. But the, the, the amount of antibiotics we prescribe is massive. And we do know that there are all side effects. Um, so what about the long-lasting effects of antibiotics on the gut microbiota? So there was a nice uh, PNS work. Uh, some time ago already, in which they showed that a simple course of antibiotics, whether it was penicillin, whether it was uh, cyprofloxacin, had a profound and rapid impact on the diversity of the gut microbiota, and it can take weeks up to months before, if it even occurs, you have to return to baseline gut microbiota uh, diversity levels. And you have to realize that also um, you can, uh, the bacteria that are not intrinsically sensitive for prescribed antibiotics can be wiped out because of this uh, dependency of each other in the gut microbiota of all these bacteria. So for instance, if you give vancomycin, which of course has a gram-positive spectrum, you can also see depletion of gram-negative bacteria. And then this is an article, a nature article of Martin Blazer, who is one of the godfathers of the microbiota uh, world, and he says, stop the killing of beneficial bacteria. And of course, when we talk about antibiotics, we have always those concerns of inducing resistance. But there is more. Perhaps permanent changes to our protective flora could have more serious consequences than even the uh, effects on the resistance. So he says, because since the discovery of the penicillins, since 60 years, we are giving more and more antibiotics. And that also could mean that uh, each generation of um, uh, well, of, uh, of, of new people, each generation could be in life with a smaller endowment of ancient microbes than the last. And that could have, have important implications. So there is this troubling correlation, and here you see the number of antibiotics, the number of courses given to children. Here, th oh sorry, that's on the x-axis, the number of courses. And here you see the risk of uh, inflammatory bowel diseases but also other inflammatory diseases like asthma, uh, et cetera, you, and obesity, even diabetes. There's this correlation between antibiotic use uh, and the occurrence of these, um, these diseases. However, of course, watch out. These are just correlations, and often the cause-effect uh, is totally lacking. But anyway, perhaps there's an indication that there is this troubling correlation. So when we talk about the gut microbiota, um, and about the functions of the gut microbiota, perhaps you can even say that the mi gut microbiota is, an, is its own separate organ, that we have a new organ out there. If you look at the functions, the gut microbiota is implied in metabolism, for instance, for the synthesis of nutrients, vitamins, metabolites, develop development of the immune system, and in defense against pathogens. So locally in the gut, competition for nutrients, and space with pathogens, think about uh, C. diff. Um, but then there's this new thing that perhaps, a apart from a local host defense against the bacteria, the pathogens in your gut, perhaps the gut microbiota also plays a role in the systemic host defense against bacteria by priming of systemic immune effector cells. And I would like, and 
uh, for those interested, uh, this is uh, a review we wrote about the potential role of the gut microbiota in critically ill patients. But look at that systemic effect. And uh, this is a uh, Nature Med paper from the Weiser Group, uh, Net Nature Med uh, 2010, who really was the first article describing this potential uh, mechanism in mice. So it is called recognition of peptoglycan from the microbiota by NOT1, that's a pattern recognition receptor, enhanced systemic innate immunity. So what he did, he took normal wild type mice and um, uh, treated them with antibiotics, really broad spectrum, ampi, uh, neomycin, metronidazole, and vancomycin in their drinking water, and then he looked at their innate immune effector cells. And, in, and then he used the uh, bone marrow-derived neutrophils, and those bone marrow-derived neutrophils derived from gut microbiota depleted mice were less capable to kill, in this instance, Staph aureus. Similar mechanisms have been shown now, for instance, for asthma. So this is the hypothesis. The gut microbiota, gut microflora, prime systemic innate immunity. So you have the gut, and in the gut you have all those beneficial bacteria, and they, um, they release all kinds of MAMs, microorganism associated molecular patterns. For instance, LPS, flagella, in this instance, peptoglycan. They are transferred to the systemic circulation in the blood. And then they can prime, in this case neutrophils, to prime them and then they are ready for an eventual attack or by invading pathogens. In this case, they are priming and they have an enhanced killing capacity. So a next step could be in those patients that we treat with antibiotics, that you give antibiotics and then you see a depletion of the gut microbiota so you can wonder that there is, are also diminished levels of, for instance, in this case, peptoglycan, and then you also have a diminished priming function of those innate immune effector cells and a diminished antibacterial host defense. So we wondered what would be the role in an in vivo model of sepsis of the gut microbiota. And we turned to, pneumo to pneumonia because pneumonia is the number one cause of, uh, of sepsis. And we turned to strep pneumo because strep pneumo is the number one cause of pneumonia. This was our hypothesis. We thought the gut microbiota contributes to the host defense against pneumonia. So we thought perhaps there is something like a gut-lung axis that in the gut you have all those micro uh, or, uh, organism associated, associated molecular patterns go into the systemic circulation. They prime, for instance, in the lung, the alveolar macrophages. So this is our mouse model. We have normal black six wild-type mice, retreated mice with the same antibiotic uh, regime as uh, in the Nature Met uh, paper of Weiser's group. We stop the treatment for two days. Then we e induce pneumosepsis by treating the, the, the mice with strep pneumo through the intranasal route. And um, as a first uh, readout, we looked at mortality. And we saw this, eff this protective effect of the gut microbiota during pneumococcal pneumonia. The effect is modest, but it was persistently there. So mice in which the gut microbiota was depleted by using antibiotics, they did worse in this model. And that translated into all endpoints, actually. So when we looked at the bacteria outgrowth in the lung and in the blood, we also did see that those mice in which the gut microbiota was depleted did worse. So the black bars are the controls, the white bars are the antibiotic-treated mice, and then they were given strep pneumo, and in the lung you see an increased load, and in the blood you also see an increased load. Again, the effect is modest, I think, because there's so much redundancy in the system. Then we looked at the pathology, so we were very successful to induce uh, severe pneumonia in those mice. You see all those infiltrates on the H&E uh, slides uh, with the help of the pathology. And then these are the untreated mice, these are the microbiota de depleted mice. Of the, these are the lungs at 6 hours and at 24 hours. And you do see that those microbiota depleted mice, they do worse. And also, if you do that, uh, if you do that blinded, mm -hmm. and you score those scoops for pathology and point parameters, we saw the same for uh, parameters of multi-organ failure in this model. So these are slides of the liver. 
those gut microbiota depleted mice, you saw a little bit more liver uh, damage also if you looked at the uh, trans uh, values in LDH. So then we thought, hey, there is this protective effect of the gut microbiota during uh, strep pneumo pneumonia, but how would that work? So, as said, we turned to those alveolar macrophages, because during pneumonia, the alveolar macrophages are really the, the directors, the orchestrators of the immune response. So, we took those alveolar macrophages out of the mice in which the gut microbiota was depleted, and we did uh, whole genome arrays. And in those whole genome arrays, we saw that there were marked differences between both groups, and especially in those pathways that were important for energy metabolism and those pathways that were important for phagocytosis. So we did, with those alveolar macrophages, we did ex vivo stimulation assays, and because of the microarray results, we looked at phagocytosis. And there we, there we saw this really big difference. So these are the alveolar macrophages of the uh, microbiota depleted uh, mice treated with antibiotics and the controls. And we did see that those alveolar macrophages derived from mice in which the gut microbiota was depleted had a decreased capacity to phagocytose uh, streptococcus pneumoniae. And we saw that this effect was compartment de dependent because we also looked at peritoneal macrophages and there was no effect. Then we looked at those alveolar macrophages to saw how, how they did respond to all kinds of pattern recognition uh, agonists, so for instance to LTA or to LPS. And then we also saw that their capacity of those alveolar macrophages derived from microbiota depleted mice to produce in this instance IL-6 after LTA or LPS ex vivo stimulation was severely hampered. So those alveolar macrophages were less capable to phagocytose and to mount immune response. So we saw this effect in uh, Streptococcus uh, pneumoniae, and actually it was just uh, this part of those uh, part of the data was just published yesterday in, uh, in GUT. But then we thought, hey, is it only for Streptococcus pneumoniae, or would it also hold true for other gram-negative causes of bacteria? And then we turned um, to uh, Klebsiella pneumonia same model, intranasal delivery of, of Klebsiella, and then uh, those mice, that's also lead, that's a lethal model. And then this is my favorite uh, uh, bug, Burgdier pseudomoli, the cost of agent of uh, melioidosis, which is quite prevalent in the top end of Australia. Um, and that's, by some, that's considered a nice model for gram-negative sepsis. Anyway, same model, those mice were treated with uh, antibiotics, they were given Klebsiella pneumoniae, or they were given Burgundia or Pseudomoli, and actually you see the same sort of phenotype. So on the left, the Klebsiella pneumoniae in the, in the uh, liver, in the blood, so the systemic dissemination of those bacteria, uh, those mice did worse. In here it is showed for the bacterial counts in the liver and the blood, but we did see the same if you look at the cytokines, if you look at the pathology. So to summarize this, uh, this could be this proposed model for gut lung access in severe bacterial pneumonia. If you have the normal situation here, that you have the gut releasing all those uh, microbiota um, uh, uh, mediated factors or MAMs, or you can have, give them all kinds of names. They're in the systemic circulation, they prime alveolar macrophages, and then in the case of an invasion of pathogens, then your alveolar macrophages are ready for that. But if we treat patients, of course we have to do that in a lot of instances, but if we treat them with antibiotics, you get a depletion of the gut microbiota, and this, this access works less efficiently. So then, uh, as, a, as a final part, could we use this uh, knowledge to develop novel treatment targets uh, to manipulate the system in mice uh, for gut microbiota in uh, sepsis. And that's a quite a big research field, so this is just an overview of it. Uh, I call it counteracting the negative effects of antibiotics on immunity. So there had to be a lot of discussion about uh, biotics, but pro uh, beyond probiotics. So you, for instance, you could also directly give short-chain fatty acids, I did not talk about it, but for instance butyrate, 
which is essential nutrient for uh, epithelial cells. So because if you give antibiotics, you will get a depletion of a lot of uh, uh, bacterial uh, uh, strains from the gut microbiota. They do produce, uh, for instance, butyrate, and you could perhaps give that. Or another approach is that you give those MAMs. For instance, you give administration of bacterial lig ligands to boost the immune tone during antibiotic therapy. For instance, you t give an LPS, flagella, and then you give it orally, which is, of course, a little bit strange if you give it in sepsis because we also have models in which we give LPS to mice. We also give to human volunteers in our, our lab as a model for sy the systemic inflammatory sy uh, syndrome. But in this case, it is given orally in lower doses, all experimental, of course. And then there's the fecal microbiota transplantation. And at the moment, uh, there are now 21 cli clinical trials in patients who use uh, stool transplantation in C, C. diff infections. Um, and I have one slide of that of my, uh, my colleague, uh, Els van Noot, who, uh, who did that uh, some years ago. Um, and then my, my other colleague used now uh, fecal microbiota transplantation in a renal transplant patient. And you know those patients in which sometimes there are recurrent infections with multidrug resistant gram negative. In, in this case, an ESBL E. coli. And um, so we, we're, we were short of antibiotic options. And she did treat this patient in a trial, uh, it's, well, within the clinical trial, with fecal microbiota transplantation. And then uh, the, the ESBL E. coli was gone, just the number one. And then I already showed these two patients with therapy refractory sepsis who were treated with uh, stool transplantation. So just one, two, two slides on the C. diff uh, stool transplantation. Um, so this is what my colleague does. Um, so in recurrent C. diff infections, uh, she uses the stool of a uh, family member. She screens it uh, for uh, all kinds of uh, viral and bacterial uh, pathogens. They give a uh, nasal, nasal duodenal tube, and those patients are treated with, uh, with fresh stool. And at the end of the procedure, she gives uh, a peppermint. So she, she published uh, this, this uh, already two years ago in the, in the New England, uh, uh, and the, the, the effects are really fascinating. So I, a lot of you have, have, have read this paper, um, but here is the other control group. So recurrent uh, C. diff infections, vancomycin treatment, recurrence of 30%, and then with treating them with one or two uh, fecal microbiota trans transplantations, you see a success rates of 90%. And this is now pretty much standard of care uh, for those really severe, uh, uh, difficult to treat patients. And uh, those numbers uh, st are still there. And then we turned again to our mouse to see if that would work. And so we treated our mouse in the uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae uh, group with a healthy stool of their uh, brother and sisters who were not uh, sick. And you could see that we were successful in um, increasing the diversity again after fecal microbiota transplantation. So you do not see a return to baseline, but you see that the diversity of the microbiota is increased after um, uh, a stool transplant. And we could also see that we could reverse this phenotype again in terms of bacterial numbers in the lung and in terms of the cytokines. So I don't know, would not say that it's a new treatment, but it's more a proof of principle that this phenotype we did see was gut microbiota dependent. But then again, is fecal microbiota transplantation is not really a very elegant treatment option, I think. So perhaps if you know which ingredients of the stool transplant are really doing the job, it would be quite nicer if you give those specific ingredients. So perhaps you, you, we could uh, see which bacteria are doing the job or which MAMS, LPS, uh, flagella, etc., is doing the job. So as a last slide, this is work of others. Uh, this is a mouse model of E. coli-induced uh, pneumonial uh, sepsis. And then they treated those mice with oral LPS supplementation. And here you see uh, the survival. And here you see uh, the microbiota depleted mice. Well, they were doing worse than uh, controls. But those mice who were treated with low-dose LPS per, or, per os orally, they did a little bit better. So also really preclinical, pre a lot of questions, but it is perhaps an interesting uh, 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 approach to study in the lab. So 
And as a last slide, I like this idea of Tosh, it's a CAD paper of some years ago. And he says, in, um, we, 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 of course, when we talk about antibiotics, but we, have to be, uh, we have to reduce the amounts we prescribe, but we also have to take into, care, uh, into account the effect of the, on the microbiota of the antibiotics we give. So we, perhaps we should refocus our antibiotic stewardship programs to reduce the impact of the microbiota, we should develop more microbiota sparing antimicrobial uh, microbio, microbiota therapy. And then I thought this was a very interesting suggestion. He said before, be, perhaps before we are going to treat patients with a lot of antibiotics, and of course you can think about your ICU patient population, but you can also think about patients that will undergo, for instance, an, um, a stem cell transplant for for a uh, hematological malignancy, perhaps before we, treat, we go for such a, a treatment course, we should store their stool. And then at the end, if those patients do receive a lot of antibiotics, we can give them again their own stool back. Um, so that was an idea of Tosh. So as a last uh, slide, um, just to take home a future perspective on the gut microbiota in, uh, in sepsis. I think that the gut microbiota has so many functions that perhaps you could argue that you can see it as a separate organ with both local and systemic uh, functions. Um, and then we d could show, but that was in the mouse model, that there is this gut-lung axis and there is this uh, protective role of the gut microbiota during uh, strep pneumo, uh, pneumonia-induced sepsis. But then again, I would like to stress a point that these are really preclinical data and there's now so much discussion of the bi microbiota and so many associations, but, um, and, and ac actually the gut microbiota is uh, now being investigated in every, almost every disease you can imagine, but there are so many associations, but not really mechanistic studies. So um, uh, that, that is really an uh, important point, I think. And I also think that at the moment, Recurrency diff infection is a valid indication for stool transplantation, but also the only one uh, who, what, which is really proven there that could be in a, in a, an indication, uh, but, and, and no other indications yet. But anyway, I think that all those novel developments are interesting food for thought and uh, are potent uh, uh, giving us new research questions which we should address uh, in the lab. All right, uh, that's that. I would like to thank once again the organizers. I would like, like to thank the folks uh, back home, the postdocs and the PhD students, and of course my long-term uh, mentor, Tom van der Poel, who heads our uh, department at the moment. Thank you very much. <laughs>